Welcome to the Design Defect. Steve, what are we doing here today? Well, Jamie, today we're going to be talking about Blizzard. So we're going to be talking about delicious DQ treats? Mm. Uh, not exactly. We're talking about Blizzard the game studio. Ah, uh, well, that's disappointing. So are we going to be getting into Overwatch, uh, World of Warcraft expansions, Rise of Necromancers? No, we're going back about 20, 25 years when Blizzard was just getting their feet wet in the video game industry. So you could say we're going back to when Blizzard was a snowflake. Steve, why don't you take us into our first review? Uh, uh, yeah, here we go. Radical Psycho Machine Racing was unleashed onto the world in November of 1991 and is most commonly referred to as RPM Racing. Honestly, this is probably the least interesting game with exploding cars ever created. Fortunately, Blizzard's first video game does have some fascinating history behind it that goes beyond it just being their first game. Let's start with the name, and not the ridiculous name of the game itself, but the name of the studio that created it. Blizzard was formerly known as Silicon and Synapse, and actually developed RPM Racing, The Lost Vikings, and even Rock and Roll Racing under that moniker. Blizzard didn't become Blizzard until 1994. Now back to the nail-biting experience that is RPM Racing. You may have noticed something interesting about the resolution this game appears to be running at, and if you did, give yourself a pat on the back. RPM Racing runs in Mode 5, which is basically Mode 7's less popular cousin. Mode 5 is capable of displaying a background image at a whopping 512 by 448 but dramatically reduced the available color palette. There were other games like Secret of Mana that took advantage of this, but it was typically only for menu screens. The last thing that saves this game from obscurity is that it was apparently the first Super Nintendo game developed in the United States. Go America! Seriously though, the only fun to be had in RPM Racing is in the track editor. Seeing how this entire game is essentially a port of another less than stellar racing game for the Commodore 64 called Racing Destruction Set, the controls here are cumbersome at best. That being said, you can immediately max out your car and even lower the gravity so that even a tiny bump in the road will keep you airborne for days. My personal challenge to you, see if you can create a track that confuses the AI into driving the wrong way, like this. People say Blizzard created a critically acclaimed smash hit with Blackthorn. That's what they say. Let me preface my review of Blackthorn by stating this. I hate platformers. I don't play platformers, and I'm very bad at platformers. But I did this thing for you, dear viewer. Now for your history lesson. Blackthorn was published in 94 on the SNES and DOS. A year later, it was released on the more powerful Sega 32X with a higher color palette and four new levels. Let's dive into the game itself. The music greatly adds to the ambiance, but you would not expect any less from famed composer Glenn Stafford, who has worked on StarCraft 1 and 2, World of Warcraft, and Warcraft 3. The 32X maintains some graphical superiority, but it is certainly not overwhelming. That being said, I enjoyed the SNES port more, as the controls felt a fraction more crisp and I could fade into the background to avoid enemy fire a bit quicker. Both the SNES and the Overhaul 32X versions received positive critical reviews, but playing this game was more chore than joy. I must praise Blizzard though for having the forethought to put in passwords so that I could skip around the levels, or Kyle Blackthorn Vleros would have never gotten past his second Kadrasulian. The noticeable lag between entering commands on my controller and their execution, along with being trapped in animations and having to wait a brief moment before attempting my next action left a sour taste in my mouth. But I thoroughly enjoyed the story and the dark tone, I even gave out a little evil chuckle when Kyle let loose with a one-handed no-look blast from his boomstick at an androthy who was chained to the wall. All told, Blackthorn is a good game with a few shortcomings that could potentially stop anyone but true fans from enjoying the slaughter. Jeez. 
Released in 1992, The Lost Vikings proved that Western developers were capable of creating compelling and creative platformers for consoles. Beyond the original Super Nintendo release, Olaf and company made their way onto pretty much anything that could be plugged into a screen, including the Genesis, which had five exclusive levels not present anywhere else. At the time of its release, The Lost Vikings impressed most editorials with clever puzzles, bright colorful graphics, and a truly unique core concept. This concept has been emulated countless times since in games like The Cave, Thomas Was Alone, Trine, and plenty of others. The Lost Vikings is a great blend of tight platforming, light action, and intricate puzzles that make you feel just a little bit smarter for accomplishing them. While the game supports cooperative play, even without another player, you're basically forced to cooperate with yourself to utilize each of the three Vikings' abilities to progress to the next level. You can only control one character at a time, so co-op can definitely help with your efficiency in completing each stage. One other thing this game has going for it is the writing. This game was and still is funny today. I really enjoy getting to see the Vikings' individual personalities come out between stages and some of the same jokes that I laughed at over 20 years ago still make me laugh today. However, nothing in this game makes me laugh more than two simple frames of animation. And if you're a fan of the game, then you already know exactly what I'm talking about. Olaf is like that plumber that you hire to fix your kitchen sink who doesn't mind a light breeze when he's hard at work. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And you know what? Just like that plumber, I'm inclined to leave Olaf and his butt cleavage alone. Thanks for doing what you do, Olaf. Hello, Blizzard. What's up with this Justice League Task Force fighting game? Mediocre controls? Check. Quality roster? Check. Land audio? Check. Wah wah. Overly complicated moveset to execute specials? Check, unfortunately. I dug into the story mode of this SNES version of JLTF, released in 95, to learn that ne'er do well Darkseed was attacking planet Earth. I battled through Android copies of my squad to finally confront baddies Despero, Cheetah, and Darkseed. While not the largest roster, I was pretty pleased to see Aquaman, Green Arrow, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash in the mix. I had fun for about 20 minutes, but after I'd seen what the different characters had to offer, I knew it would be another 20 years at least before I blew the dust off this game again. Both the SNES and Genesis ports received mostly negative reviews when it came out, citing to its combination of poor controls and lackluster animations. What's baffling is that Blizzard thought this game would do anything other than flop since it was released four years after the vastly superior Street Fighter II. While it provided me with a flitting feeling of nostalgia, the game's horribly animated exploding character corpses and patently awful score make this a pretty bad game. I would put this in the bottom two worst fighting games I've ever played. It's a fraction better than Ultimate Fighting Championship, a game that Steve and I yanked out of my PlayStation in the 90s and threw against the wall so hard that the disc exploded into tiny fragments. So, Jamie, based on what we played so far, do you think Blizzard has a bright future in the gaming industry? Well, Steve, frankly, I believe this storm is going to blow itself out. All right. Well, do you want to give him a second chance here? Yeah, why not? All right. Here we go. Forget it. On February 27th of 1997, Blizzard gave us the gift of The Lost Vikings 2, otherwise known as Norse by Norse West. Expanding on the original cast of three, there are now five characters total, but still only three are predetermined and playable on each level. While the original crew is mostly the same abilities, they also beat up some poor robot at the beginning of the game and wear the scrap as armor. Uh, this armor essentially just increases their mobility through the use of new mechanics and really offers up some fun new obstacles to overcome. Of course, Olaf is still rocking the plumber pants, but now he can also fart so hard that he launches himself up into the air only to crash back down at the expense of some unsuspecting smashable blocks. Yeah, take that, blocks. 
The new characters are fun to play as, but I'm really a sucker for a good wall climb, so Fang here kind of stole my heart. The Lost Vikings 2 was also brought over to the PlayStation, PC, and Saturn, with almost the same core gameplay intact. Beam Software was responsible for the 32-bit versions of the game, and seeing how it was a few years after Donkey Kong Country, they decided they had to obliterate the fantastic pixel art of the original and render out the entire game in 3D. As such, this version really didn't age too well, and everything here just looks kind of... small. It doesn't look terrible, but it just can't hold a candle to the Super Nintendo version in the graphics department. The audio, however, also got an overhaul, and I think the results here turned out much better. Every line is now voiced, and we now have some cool new music to go along with the visuals. The voice work is fine, and it's a welcome addition for me. Not sure how I feel about these CG cutscenes, though. Then, one day, while returning home from a fishing trip... Are we there yet? I'm hungry. Should have thought about that before we left. Yes, you've eaten three times today, and the sun hasn't even come up. Probably the worst thing about the updated graphics are how now some of the attacks are animation dependent. Like Fang's claw swipe here. It feels clunky and unresponsive in the PlayStation version, but feels fine in the Super Nintendo version. Now, the actual worst thing about the updated graphics is that they gave Olaf a tummy tuck and some new form-fitting pants. Sorry buddy, I hope it's not getting too hot back there. Without a doubt, Blizzard's The Death and Return of Superman is my favorite Final Fight clone. Released in 1994 for the Genesis and SNES, it came out two years after the reign of the Superman story arc, which followed on the heels of DC Comics' Death of Superman. I had not played this game before, so I was thrilled to see the Man of Steel, the Last Son of Krypton, the Metropolis Kid, and the Man of Tomorrow sling enemies across the screen and blast them with their varying super moves or beam weapons. The story tracks fairly well with the comics, the Funeral for a Friend story arc, and Roger Stern's novel by the same name. I was impressed by the amount of content that they jammed onto the cartridge, but even more impressive, especially after playing several other Blizzard console games, was the responsiveness of the controls. Superman slammed his fist into his underworlders instantaneously with my button presses while juking left and right to avoid laser traps or falling debris. I was also shocked to discover that Blizzard actually included the ability to glide around the screen or to fly up or hover down to the different platforms. Blizzard did a fantastic job on the pixel art and I enjoyed the music much more than most of the other Blizzard console games that I have played. During most Final Fight clones, the enemies and moveset begins to get a little repetitive and tedious after a while, but that's to be expected with this genre. However, I did not experience the side-scrolling brawler fatigue common with this type of game due to the different flavors of Superman I was able to play with and the variety of levels that I dominated. Of Blizzard's early console releases, this is certainly one of the best. The Final Verdict The death and return of Superman demonstrates strong appeal over 20 years after its release. Rock and Roll Racing was the last game developed under the Silicon and Synapse brand and was released here in America on June 4, 1993. Originally planned as a sequel to RPM Racing, Interplay Marketing ditched the name and added some very well done licensed music, at least for the Super Nintendo version of the game. The Genesis edition of Rock and Roll Racing is actually one of the reasons the console got a bad reputation for audio. It's literally one of the best sounding games of the 90s on the Super Nintendo. But one of the worst sounding games of the 90s on the Genesis. Gross. Rock and Roll Racing competes with Mario Kart for Best Racer on the Super Nintendo and is one of my all-time favorite games to this day. This is the only game that I played for this video that I had to force myself to stop playing because I was genuinely enjoying it so much. 
and there's a good chance we'll load it up again and try to beat it in the coming weeks. One thing that makes this game stand out for me on the Super Nintendo is that, similar to The Lost Vikings, it's oozing with personality. From the rock and roll soundtrack and commentary by Loudmouth Larry to the apocalyptic aesthetics, rock and roll racing feels like an arcade style racing game set in the Mad Max universe. Plus, it has Olaf. Interplay made a sequel called Red Asphalt here in the United States, and if you haven't heard of it, then I'm actually sorry I just told you about it. Yeah, it's, it's terrible, and in no way resembles the original. In late 2013, however, there was a game called Motor Rock developed by Yard Team and sold on Steam. The game features many assets from the original, plus some new cars and a larger playfield, but for whatever reason, they actually called it Rock and Roll Racing 3D upon release and Blizzard had Valve pull the game from the store. It's too bad they didn't just call it something else and change the models around so we could all enjoy their hard work, but oh well. I'm sure Blizzard will give us a true sequel once everyone gets tired of Overwatch, right? Oh Diablo, how can I love and hate you so much at the same time? I've sunk countless hours into the original PC Diablo, and it was, without a doubt, one of my favorite games of the decade. Then I played the PlayStation version when it came out two years later in 98, and it barely felt like the same game. The difference in quality between the PC and PlayStation versions are so dramatic that Blizzard arguably should have skipped the PlayStation port altogether. While the PS4's Diablo 3 plays extremely well with the DualShock controller, Blizzard certainly had not mastered the art of sharp, gamepad-based gameplay with the inception of their Diablo series. Targeting enemies and generally moving the character are difficult at best, and the kindest adjective I can use to describe the graphics is muddy. The PlayStation is not known for its 3D rendering prowess and Blizzard had to drastically cut corners with everything from dungeon detail to spell effects to the hellish denizens themselves to port the game to the PlayStation. Also, the user interface provides a visually unpleasant overlay of information. While the PC Diablo uses detailed demonic and angelic statues to hold up the health and mana globes respectively in an enlarged UI used to frame the game, Blizzard went with two cylinders of fluid that float over the gameplay along with a toolbar where potions and scrolls are stored. Of course, the choice of interface was necessary due to the lack of keyboard for hotkey bindings, but that does not justify the poor UI. At least, there's the audio. The easily recognizable score in Decker Kane's iconic Hello Friends, Stay a While and Listen treat players to all of the audio goodness of the original PC game that helped make it a smash hit. Blizzard did the best they could with the hardware they had, but the PlayStation port is a poor imitation of the PC version. Hello, my friend. Stay a while and listen. Whoa, what can I do for you? So, Jamie, do you think Blizzard has any legs to get him past the 32-bit era? Well, they might have a sleeper hit in Diablo, but we'll just have to see. You think so? Because I, my only issue with Diablo is that it doesn't have Olaf in it. I think without Olaf, it's going to be really hard to kind of sell that one. But they do have a nice Deckard cane, but most likely they're going to fail and Ubisoft will buy them. And then that'll be that. Ah, uh, appreciate the expert analysis. Well, mm -hmm. that's it for this episode, guys. We'll see you again next time. Okay, bye-bye. The stage is set. The green flag drop. Ouch! Olaf unleashes hot fury. Whoa!